Welcome back to another episode of Intercept U. We are happy to have you here today, and today I have Joe Pasma with me. He's our National Sales Manager at Intercept. We're going to talk about a variety, kind of some miscellaneous subjects when it comes to getting the panels to the site, and what do you do with them once the semi shows up. So we're going to start out with just unloading the truck itself. What does that entail? Uh, what are some, uh, some, some suggestions? To give you some background, Joe and I both have have about 10 years experience on site as well as other uh, areas around the, the SIP project, but 10 years of, of building SIP houses themselves or SIP projects. So Joe, let me ask you, what, what have you found to be challenges or solutions uh, when it comes to the, that, the truck showing up and now what? I think, John, before you even start with the truck showing up to the job site, um, you have to have an idea in your mind how you're going to put your project together. The drafting team at Intercept, when they put the panels together, they start numbering them from one side and they go around the project and, and number them. Well, that doesn't necessarily fit how we actually install the panels on site because of site constraints. You might be on a cliff and have to start on the opposite side from where they numbered the pro the panels. So you have to keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're trying, we as Intercept are trying to minimize the number of trucks that we send to the site. So a lot of times we will not have stickers or spacers between panels, which means that you can get a little bit more material on the truck but that means that offloading on site is a little bit more challenging in the sense that you actually have to climb up on the truck and push the panels off. So if you want to have quick unloading and you're willing to have an extra truck show up at the site, you can ask your sales rep to actually have the plant put stickers or spacers in between. So then you can offload with extension forks on a, on a lull or an all-terrain forklift or whatever. So, so that's really the first step to unloading the truck is, is to get it loaded the way you want um, in the plant itself. Yeah, absolutely. Left to the loaders. I, I tease our loaders that they should have a degree in Tetris because they load that truck, they fill every nook and cranny because you can't put enough panels on to overload the truck weight wise. It's all about mass. It's all about volume uh, of filling that truck. And so when you're unloading a truck, you'll get to a little space uh, uh, between panels and there'll be a box of clips or hangers shoved in that space because they do. They're really good at using every nook and cranny, but uh, it comes out like a shuffled deck of cards uh, after they do that. Uh, they don't worry about the, the numbers in order. It's all about the, the panels and where they're going to fit the best and how they're going to go on. So uh, it's something to be aware. So that kind of takes us to the next step. Okay, now you've gone through that process and maybe you've, you're, you're in a situation where it's, it's, it's worth paying the extra to have the extra truck or uh, to have it loaded with dunnage. Either way, the truck gets there. Now you need to stage the panels. And there's a variety of different challenges that come with that. One is lot size. What, what kind of room do you have? What kind of space? Is the floor deck already built? Uh, things of that nature. But really, what's your goal when it comes to staging the panels? Well, the truckers typically allow about, we use independent truckers uh, to haul the material. And they generally allow about two hours to offload the material. So because the plant does such a good job with Tetris, you really have to have a, a, a spot set up that you can just get the material off the truck. And then once you get it off the truck, you can move it around and, and stage it, if you will, in, in a way that makes sense for you using um, and the way you're going to put the panels up on the site itself. So having that spot, sometimes... Um, what we ended up doing is is using someplace a vacant lot down the block um, if you're building in the city and you have tight quarters with the adjacent lot you don't have the ability to just spread stuff out like you do if you're out in the farm country kind of a thing um, we've had some stuff where we've actually had to get permits to block off sidewalks and streets to stage the panels and then shuffle them around and, and move them that way. So each specific project is going to dictate how you go about doing it. But again, have a 
plan in mind. Don't just think the truck's going to show up and you offload it and then you're going to be able to start putting it up because I guarantee that the first panel that you decide that you're going to use is going to be on the bottom of the farthest stack back. It's just the way it goes. It's a so you don't have to spend a day shuffling panels around to get them in, in the order that you want to put them up. But that will save as you move into the, the installation process. Yeah, sometimes, especially when we're new on uh, and doing this, we have this idea, we're going to unload them systematically. But we just don't have time to do that. That, that truck driver, like you said, he's got a couple of hours. He's got to get back onto his next load. And so we really got to get him on the ground. One of the things that we learned is don't stack the piles of them too close to each other. Give yourself some room because, like you said, invariably the panel you need is going to be in one of the stacks that's, that's back. And then as you do start to sort them, we also found that it's not necessary to sort them all in order. Uh, you don't have to find one and, and have that on the top of a pile and two next. But if you start, as, as you're moving panels around, keep putting the highest numbers on the bottom because you're going to use them from the lowest numbers, uh, typically speaking. Now, it might not be from one. You might choose to start in a different spot, but you're always going to need the lowest number uh, at, at the top. So if, if the lowest numbers are on top, uh, if one is on top of that pile and two is on top of that pile, that's fine as long as you can get to them. Uh, so, so that's just something to keep in mind as you start to spread them out. And something you learn after doing project after project, uh, is how to make this a little bit, a little bit easier. Um, so another thing that we'd like to, to touch on is the kind of tools and equipment that are necessary or valuable. Uh, what we can get, what a, a builder can get by with versus what's really handy to have. So what did you find were valuable tools? In, in, in well, I'll, since we're talking about the unloading, I'll start with the tools that we would use, the equipment that we would use to actually unload the panels from the trailer. Um, we used a skid steer with four foot forks. Um, Intercept does four foot and eight foot panels. So the four foot forks work well on the four foot panels. When you start using jumbo panels, like the panels that you see in the background behind me, um, eight foot wide panels, you're going to need a fork that fork extensions that are seven or eight feet long, because if you're using just the four footers, they'll fall off the, the forks. So that's one of the things. Fork extensions um, are a thing to take a look at. The other thing is skid steer works well for running around the site. All-terrain forklifts with extendable booms work really well for not only offloading the material, but then you can use it for actually setting roof panels or, or trusses like you see in, in the background behind me. So um, I'll just things. jump in there. That one, a, a, a lull sky track, telehandler, all-terrain forklift, they're called so many different things, depending on who you're talking to. That is a, such a valuable tool throughout the process with it. because we just talked about stacking the panels and you're going to have a stack behind a stack. Well, you can reach over there and get that pile. Uh, you can't do that with a skid steer. Skid steers are, are okay, and we've done it, and, and we've gotten by. But if if the job allows you to have a, a lull or a sky track on it, you will find that to be a, a very valuable tool. A lot of the work that we did was on small, tight lots. And what we found advantageous was to use um, a skid steer with extension forks, and then we had a single axle boom truck, and it was one of the pioneer kind that had the, um, it, the cab station was right behind the, the driver cab, and it had four legs that would extend out right at that spot. So you actually had 380 degrees of rotation from that location, and you could, you could we found you could set it on a tight site. It had a 63-foot boom on it with a, a 15 or 30-foot boom extension. And we could reach the whole site setting panels with that. So some people say, well, you need a crane to set these things. They don't weigh much. They're four pounds a square foot. So what, an eight by 24 is about a thousand pounds, give or take somewhere in that range. The jib extension on these pieces of equipment weigh more than what the panels do. So it's really not heavy material that you're lifting. It's just awkward trying to get it to where you need to reach to. So something with a big reach, um, we found really advantageous from that standpoint. 
I so, think you said you had 380 degrees of, of range, which is 20 degrees more than the rest of the world gets. Right. So we, you, you guys in Minnesota, you're always, you're always just a little ahead of you the know, it, it, it could actually go past the full circle. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Which is sort of nice because you always need that little bit more depending on where you start. So, <laughs> all right, very good. So I'm glad you get that explained to me. Um, all right, so continue on with the idea of tools. Um, so now we're, we're that was, those are the tools for yeah getting started and getting things moved around. How about building the the project itself? Lifting plates, um, intercept supplies can supply lifting plates that are actually surface mounted to the panels. And then you're able to hoist with the hook that they have, or they have pins that you can drill through the panel. And then there's a nut on the bottom side. I prefer the plates themselves myself. Um, that way you're not poking holes in the panel. But again, it depends on, on how you go about installing and what your crew likes to do. Both work very well. If you do use the plates or, or the, the pins, you have to go back and fill the hole that you drill in the panel with expanding foam. So and, and you also have to be very aware with pins. My crew used pins, your crew used plates. Um, but what, with one thing that we learned with, with pins is since they do go all the way through the panel, for instance, on, on what you have in your picture right there with uh, the trusses like that, um, you have to make sure that, that there's room for the pin to settle down. So if you're setting over a, a timber frame or, or trusses uh, like that, you have to make sure there's room. Uh, we found that in that situation, plates were the, were the way to go so that we didn't have to worry. Even when you get to your overhang, especially your gable ends on your overhang, sometimes it's a challenge to use the pin and get it to set the panel in place without it setting on top of the wall. So that's something to, to factor in. We, we had multiple plates too, so that you'd have two on the panel up in the air and then maybe two or three on panels that were placed and then there's another set of two or three on the ground so that the ground crew is putting things together. If, if you only have two plates, you waste a lot of time shuffling stuff back and forth. And the other thing that the plates will do for you in the air, both for the roof panels and wall panels, is you can use them as lever points to actually pull the panels together with come-alongs or trucking straps or, or devices like that that help pull the panels together. And there's some neat come alongs um, that are out in the industry now that we didn't have 20 years ago when I was doing it. So it's, it's sort of cool to see some of that stuff. Yeah, very good. Yeah. You, you don't want your, your, your roof crew and your ground crew to be waiting on each other. So you have to have enough that your ground crew can be working while the roof crew is setting panels and vice versa. And, and if you are using a crane to set at 120 to $170 an hour, you don't want the crane sitting there while the ground crews putting waiting for the lifting plates to come back and put those screws on. You have to have enough to keep keep the process uh, fluid. Absolutely. So, a okay, so tools. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. A couple other tools to think about: um, chainsaw with a foot on it that has a long bar. We had an electric steel chainsaw that we could actually modify panels, um, cut plum cuts, or things grow. And the nice thing about the longer 21 inch bar or 22 inch bar is that you're able to cut both sides of a, of a 12 inch panel with a 12, 12 plumb cut on it and make one cut. Otherwise skill saws, circular saws where you cut both sides and flip it over and then use a, a reciprocating saw or something to, to cut the foam in between um, are things that you're going to need. Um, so, so that kind of takes us to a, a, a new era, a new area of SIP construction. It's the imperfections. And we would like to, to, to be able to say that our panels all come out absolutely perfect. The foundation is absolutely perfect. Everything is gonna to fit together. There's not gonna be any glitches. You'll never need to adjust a panel. That's not realistic. Um, it's, not, it's not a perfect world. Uh, there's, there's human error that's involved in the situation. There's also, it, it, it's wood, it moves. It's, it's, uh, there's, some, there's some variations uh, from one spot to another. So when it comes to that idea of, of altering panels of cutting, now we have in our, our construction manual call before you cut, but sometimes it's just a little trim here or something that to fit that together. So you mentioned that chainsaw, what other tools are valuable when it comes to adjusting panels? 
we as Intercept supply or can, can supply what are called hot knives. It looks like a, an old fashioned charcoal starter, if you will. And it, the, the width of the, the iron is the same thickness as our foam cores. So you can use that to recess foam. Avalon makes a tool for um, EPS, expanded polystyrene type work. We use those and found that to work really well for cutting um, panels. We also had um, handles and Avalon, uh, when you go to their website, you can find those. They're, they're actually handles with wire, nichrome wire that's over 24 feet long, and then a rheostat. So you can actually have one person on either side in the field and cut long 24 foot panels and recess, uh, um, change a recess, or if you need to narrow the panel up or whatever, and basically get it, um, shape it exactly the way you need it out in the field. So those are, are valuable tools as well. Yeah, um, very good. So, so, there, there may be some adjustments. There may be some, some things that need to be addressed in the field. And having those tools it takes it from being a dramatic <laughs> problem uh, to just, a, just we have the solution. We can, we can make the adjustment and keep moving. And that's what you want to be able to do. Uh, one other thing that comes to my mind is we send out a lot of caulk. It's, uh, we send it in sausage tubes as a rule. And we're recommending three beads of sealant between each panel. And so uh, if you're doing that with the sausage guns that we send, <laughs> uh, you're going to look like Popeye at the end of it with these great big forearms, right? So having a battery operated sausage gun or two on the site is an invaluable tool. You will find, especially in cold weather, uh, that's something that uh, the, the, this, the the sealant does get stiffer in cold weather, and so it's something you're going to want to be thinking about. Uh, did you guys create a hot box or something along those lines to try to keep that sealant from getting we too did actually to work with? And and what we used was an actual cooler that you could plug in and change it from the cooling side of things to the heating side of things, and that was really slick for for cold weather work. And then um, when we work in the summertime, we'd turn it on and cool it, keep the beer cool for beer 30. So it worked, it worked pretty good. Both tools, tools, of tools of the trade. There we yeah. go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, anything to add? Any other, any other tools or, or suggestions that you can think of at this point? Not at this point, but I'm sure we'll come up with a few more and you and I will be talking again. So. Absolutely. So, uh, folks, thank you for joining this. And if you like our discussion, do us a favor and add some comments at the bottom. Uh, give us some, some suggestions of things you'd like to hear us talk about. Uh, comment on what you're hearing here. If you have suggestions, if you're a SIP installer and have some suggestions of things that have worked for you, share it with the community so that all of us can benefit from it. And of course, uh, subscribe and, and like and all of that helps us to, to get out there and, and get in front of people. So thank you very much, and we look forward to our next discussion on Intercept U. Thanks, John.